Hello and welcome to the Green Voice Podcast where you get all the dirt on sustainability here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. I'm your host, Grant Irvin with SNB USA, and today we're coming to you from the Frick Environmental Center, uh, which is hosted by the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. Super excited to have a great guest uh, to talk about all things green, Doug Oster. Uh, Doug, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Fall is for planting. Fall is for planting. Is that a t-shirt or bumper sticker? And uh, a, a mantra. And a mantra. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm super excited to have you. Um, I was talking to uh, a very important listener, my mom. Uh, she was uh, telling me, when can you get Doug Oster on the show <laughs> and you know, talk about some uh, gardening and uh, all the things, you know, both backyard planters and, and you know, serious, uh, serious farmers out there. And I know that you cover them all. Um, you know, fall is for planning, uh, as you said, is a mantra. Tell me about the fall season. So because as uh, the days get shorter, uh, temperatures cool off, it's more conducive to root growth. Mm. And so that's what we want a plant to do, a perennial, a tree, a shrub. Instead of trying to put on top growth and flower, mm -hmm. it's getting those roots established. And, you know, a lot of people, I, I talk to people all the time, they're like, well, I think it's better to plant in the spring because I can watch it better and we get all that rain and I'm just like, I understand that and there's nothing wrong with planting right. in the spring, but um, you're, you're, if you don't get rain, let's say this season, we had 22 but, days without rain. It was very dry. Yeah. yeah and you, you put a tree in, you're going to have to water that thing to keep it alive. On the other end, even though September is not, and October are not really rainy months for us, mm -hmm. because it's so cool, because the days are shorter, that plant just gets established. You know, I've got so many different uh, flats of plants mm. and the shrubs that need to go in that I've, that I've been sitting on because I don't want to put them in when it's 95 degrees. Right. It's not fun either. <laughs> no, it's no fun. And then you, you really have to baby them along. Does that matter from like a, a resilience of a plant in terms of you, you, whether it's fall or spring, the following season, spring, winter is, is oftentimes much more harsh because of temperature, or precipitation or lack thereof. Does that make a big impact or difference or does it depend upon the type of plant? It actually depends on, on what kind of winter we have. You know, like this last winter was killer. Okay. We had all this mild temperatures and then it dropped really cold really quick and we're still seeing damage today. Really? You know, I talk a lot about that on the radio show of what people are seeing, you know, boxwoods, hollies, pachysandra, ivy, things that are, you know, pretty tough, but you had these mild 40 degree temperatures and like mm -hmm. then it warmed up a little bit and plants almost started to push out. They okay. just, the buds start swelling and they're like, you know, it's been long enough, the temperature's seeing, let's see. And then boom, 22 below. That's super harmful. Yeah, for and you know, boxwoods especially, every day I'm answering a question about boxwoods. Will they come back? What's huh. wrong? And with specific plants like that, with like a boxwood, when the winter kicks it back like that, then it's more susceptible to the pests and diseases that come after boxwoods. Uh. And so you can't just, like, I got a question this morning. I see boxwoods all around my neighborhood. They're brown. Will they come back? I said, there's no way to tell unless you have a certified arborist mm -hmm. come and take a look and probably send part of that plant away to the lab to see is it boxwood blight? Oh. Or they can see if it's leaf miner disease or other, um, okay. leaf, I mean, leaf miner uh, pest damage and maybe some other pest. You can't answer a question like that just by looking at a picture. Okay. And so uh, with boxwoods in particular, which are a great plant because they're deer resistant mm -hmm. and easy to grow, but you get one of these anomalies. You get this anomaly of a, a winter like that uh, and it's, you know, the sad thing is, is people are always telling me, oh, we just took the plant out. We just tore it out. And I'm like, oh, oh you don't want to do that. No, you got to wait it out. Yeah. You know, it might be two seasons. You got to wait it Before out. Before the plant can come yeah. back and establish yeah, yeah, itself. Yeah. You know, and as long as you're fertilizing and making sure it has the right amount of water, mm -hmm. plant, plants are very resilient, more so than you would think so. Don't just give up on a plant. Do you have any hit, uh, like coming into the fall season, some tips for folks? Uh, in terms of it's, it's fall, what they should be thinking about in terms of what they plant, when they plant, how they do oh, it. Oh, definitely. You know, for me, the number one thing is extending the season in the vegetable garden. Oh. When you choose plants that don't care about frost and you 
give them a little protection. Mm -hmm. In most winters, you can go all the way through winter. You could be harvesting all the way through winter. But again, it's like a tomato is dead at frost. Right. A right. pepper is dead at frost. Right. But you get these other things, uh, you know, mustard greens, mizuna, this thing called tat soy, uh, corn mache, uh, even bunching onions, uh, lettuces, kales, anything from that family. Right. Um, like your durable leafy greens. Right, yeah. right. You know, root crops, uh, you know, beets and carrots and stuff like that, if you've already got them going. But all the nurseries now, this, this is what I call the third season of planting. All okay. the nurseries now are carrying all this stuff huh. because people want to continue. And, and even if you don't have protection, all those plants I talked about will go through Christmas. Really? Uh, yeah, and, and people just don't understand that. And Because they're frost resistant? Yeah, they okay. don't, they, not only do they uh, survive frost, they thrive on it. Wow. So it's something like a kale, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, uh, anything from that family, once frost hits it, mm -hmm. the starches turn to sugars and they sweeten up. Oh. Like you never pick your Brussels sprouts before frost. Really? Yeah, uh, because they change okay. and they sweeten up. And the same thing with turnips. You know, I talk a lot about turnips, but people are like, what is it, 1930? But you know, <laughs> tur turnip greens and turnips, when that turnip, gets that frost it changes it changes into the sweet thing where okay you cannot duplicate it in the store okay you could duplicate it on a farm you know a farm market yep but you can't duplicate it in the store because they're grown somewhere else and it's a great turnip but but the garden turnip after frost and i've got again i got a you know probably two six packs of white turnips that i'm okay. going to put in and again, you're, you're putting this stuff in now. At worst case scenario, you're getting the greens. Mm -hmm. You know, all these greens make an amazing salad. Arugula, yeah. uh, th that thing called tatsoy is from the same family as kale, general family, like okay. a mustard family. And I always say kale is only edible with bacon. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so with the tatsoy, it's milder, and okay. you can throw it into a salad like a kid wouldn't care. They wouldn't know. They wouldn't notice. No, okay. it would just be some mild, deep green real good for you okay you know as kale is and right. I, I grow lots of kale and my wife loves kale and you know we kale's like a hot vegetable like it's, it's yeah it's, like it's, 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 it's really right it's funny how things it's like fashion it used to be like the uh <laughs> you, you know on the salad bar at pizza hut i remember growing up it was decorative right and now all of a sudden it's like you know in vogue and then so when we think of kales then there's the other type of kale there's ornamentals mm -hmm. and so that will give you beauty at least till Christmas, okay. where some of them are these short, uh, squatty reds, pinks, purples, and whites, but there are some that grow tall like a tree. Yeah. And so that one is called red boar. Okay. And it gets to be like a three foot tall tree, dark purple. Most winters without protection, it'll overwinter on its own. And when it does, then it blooms with yellow flowers the next year and then it's done. Okay. And so there's just, there's something about at the end of the season for like vegetables and these other, you know, pansies, flowering kales, these things that we put in that will go to December or sometimes all the way through the winter, uh, having something to do in the garden where there aren't many pests, mm. where you got enough rain, uh, you know, the, the bunnies are in hibernation. <laughs> you can actually have like a flourish. Yeah, garden. yeah, you can have this great garden. And there's a lot of people like me, and this is one of my, uh, things that I jump on a soapbox about because mm -hmm. so many people want to just like, all right, tomatoes are done. Like that's it. I'm yeah. I'm going to put my compost on there or cover crop or whatever it is. And I'm done. But for so many of us, especially people like me who can't stand the heat, you know, when I had hair, it was red. <laughs> and so I like, I can't take the sun or the heat, right. you know, big Irish head. Yeah. And so when I can garden out there in September, October, it's November, October. December, and just have this beautiful colors and harvesting, you know, when everybody else has stopped and, you know, <clears throat> it's no trick, right? It's just choosing the right plant. And when you're harvesting, when there's snow on the ground, I don't know. I just, I just love that part. Kind of like an invigorating point of life where things are still growing, even though yeah, it's yeah. the dead season in quote, like it, things are still happening. You know, next to spring, this is the most important season for gardeners huh. and they don't always understand that. And that's my job is to, to try and convince them that like, 
if you do this work now, mm -hmm. first off, your spring's gonna be so much better, but your winter's gonna be so much better. So extend the growing season, but are there other things too that you should be doing to prepare your garden in fall, like in, in preparation for spring? There's the putting it to bed. Okay. And so for me, putting it to bed, uh, most of it I don't put to bed anymore. It's a year round thing. Okay. And so it's all about compost. Mm. And so let's say you're putting it to bed. Just at every bed, everywhere that you're gardening, put a couple inches of compost on there, then something on top of it to hold it in place. Okay. It could be uh, a mulch. It could be this thing called a cover crop where you're planting something late in the season only to hold that compost in place. You could lose up to a quarter inch to erosion. Okay. And so you worked hard on this soil, in my case, 20 some years, right? where you know it's soft and you can just push your hand down. You don't have to dig it, you don't have to do anything. Oh, yeah. You don't want to lose any of that. Okay. And so in a cover crop, and there's a bunch of different ones, easy to find any nursery. What's a good example? Winter rye is the, is the easiest to find. It's just a okay. flat bladed grass that you plant right after your tomatoes are done. Okay. It'll hold that soil in place. You're putting compost down. Hold yep. that compost in place. It's a great uh, habitat for beneficial insects. We want to mm. always attract beneficial insects. Then, if you're a tilling gardener in the spring, you, you cut that down and you dig it in, it becomes a green manure. Uh, and so it's adding. If you are a no-till, like me, okay. you're cutting it down and just throwing another layer of compost on top. Okay. Every time you plant, you improve the soil we always say that you spend twenty dollars on the planting hole for a five dollar plant. That's that's <laughs> that's, the, the, that's the reality of gardening, and it's wow. not that the, the, the money isn't that. No, but like the investment of the time and, and, and the resources. You to never make that happen. Pl never plant without improving the soil, except for trees. Trees you use native soil, but uh, that is what the that's what gives you the green thumb. Mm -hmm. You know, I, people are always a asking me like, well how come my peppers don't do good? And the first question is, what's the soil like? And they're like, the soil? Yeah, the soil, yeah. that's what it's all about. Is it improved? Well, I don't know. I mean, I just, I just I dug a hole in yeah. there, you know, and I said, was it all clay? Uh, yeah, I think it was, you know. Uh, that's, the, that's the whole key. That's interesting. You know, it's three things. Improve the soil, know when the plants go in. Yep, time. That, that's, yeah, that's easy, you know. You don't put a tomato in now. You put in these cool weather crops. Right. And then don't let them dry out. That's Those three things will give you a good garden. You know, gardening is a lifelong learning process. Hobby. Yes. Yeah. But those three things will will get you there pretty quick. You know, one of the things that was interesting, I was reading an article the other day, uh, or no, it wasn't an article I read that inspired this. It was actually a, a, a documentary. It was just about the, the health benefits of gardening oh, um, yeah. in terms of exercise and, you know, just working with the soil and the dirt. I mean, talk about that experience. That part, the physical part, I love, but the mental part is what most people do. Mm. Uh, it's being out there. You know, the one thing I, I just love is the sound of a red-bellied woodpecker. Okay. Red-bellied woodpecker is one of the first uh, mating calls that you hear. And once you know it, yeah, it's unmistakable. And so I always think of that, like when I'm going out early in the spring. Again, I'm extending the season on the other side too. Yeah, March. 17th, St. Patrick's Day is when the peas go in. Okay. When I'm, the first time I hear that bird, I just, I picture that bird in the woods around me, mm -hmm. watching out for me and looking over me, you know? <laughs> Seriously. <Bug>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, at a certain point, the mating call stops, but it has a long, long period, that mating call. and. That's just one of the little things, you know, you find a toad, you find a snake, you yeah. find, uh, you know, whatever it might be. There's other creatures out there with yeah, you. Yeah, pollinators, the and, and, and it's just, there's something therapeutic about working in the dirt uh -huh. and working with plants. And I always tell people, plants die. Right. This is part of it. And I always tell them, I think of it this way. Something happened to it before I got the, got it. <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and if you just have that attitude, like when you start gardening, you're kind of like something dies and you're like, oh gosh, I have a brown thumb, I have a black thumb. This, that's not it. Yeah. It's just no matter what level of gardener you are, things are going to die. You know, I've got uh, this plant called Japanese Pieris. It's been there probably 50 years. 
And it's, I just looked at it, the leaves started to turn brown, and I'm like, oh man. So I had some friends come in from Davy Tree, mm -hmm. and they diagnosed it. It was some kind of pest. I was able to deal with it organically. Yeah. And I was so relieved because I wouldn't want to lose that plant, but if I did, it's not the end of the world. Something else is going to go in there. Right. Okay, the next generation of plants. You know, and at my age, too, I'm thinking a lot about when I'm uh, planting in my woods. You know, I got a declining oak forest. Oaks are, in general, in decline on mm. the eastern half of the United States. As I lose an oak, I'm putting something else in, but I might be putting something else in for someone else. Interesting. Because, you know, you're talking 20 years, 30 right, years right. down the, the road, you know, and we have, this, you know, four acres and a big old house from 1939, and we're getting older, and there's only two of us in the house. Right. You know, at some point, that's going to change, and transition. somebody else is going to get get this. What what got you into the the gardening process, mm. I guess? First thing is my grandmother uh, in this little town called Lisbon, Ohio. It's the county seat of Columbiana County, where my mother grew up, uh -huh. uh, and I was very young. Columbia is just west of Pittsburgh, or a little mm -hmm. ways, right? Say about an hour ten, I would think, yeah. on Route 30, get over there. Yep. Uh, I actually did an interesting photo project on on that little town, but that's for another day. Okay. But I was, I know I was younger than seven because I wasn't, we hadn't moved yet, and I was hanging upside down in this big maple tree in front of her house, and I'll I'll just never forget this. And I was looking, and she was in this house coat, with like purple piping, and she was caring for her tomato plants in this area she called a gully, between the two houses. Okay. And I just jumped down from the tree and went over and I, I don't know, that was the first. And then I went home and asked my mother, could we put a garden in? Okay. And she's like, sure, sure. We'll go get some tomato plants and pepper plants and yeah. stuff. And you know, back then there were no deer issues. You, you okay. didn't have to have anything fenced in. You just, uh, it was actually a spot when my dad bought this house that had a above ground pool, big giant. He said, no, no, you boys will end up, no. We're, we're selling that, okay. and where that footprint was is where my garden went. Wow. And so every year after that, we had a garden there. Okay. And later, <laughs> uh, after my dad passed, uh, my mom wanted this garden in a different place. Okay. And so I started working on the soil, and it was hard pan. It was the worst soil I'd ever... I spent three years bringing my pickup truck filled with compost on there and digging it in. And after that third year, my mom said, you know, I think I'm going to go to containers. <laughs> <laughs> so whoever has that place now right there's some good dirt underneath the, the grass is just going nuts <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no wonder like why one spot they just cut it once a week over there it's like what is what's that right. deep green what's going on there you know so through that evolution i mean you've become a big advocate of organic gardening mm -hmm. um what was that evolution? Was that always something from the beginning? Or no, like... that was an epiphany. Okay. And it's interesting because it's come full circle. So my son was about 18 months old. I had an early garden. I had uh, cabbage worms really bad. Okay. And I didn't know what to do about them. And I called a gardening friend. He said, get this stuff called Seven. Seven. Mm -hmm. okay. S-E-V-I-N. And sprinkle it on there and you'll kill the cabbage worms. And I did it. Okay. And it killed all the cabbage worms. I'm like, yeah, that was great. Take well, that then that 18-month-old kid was walking barefoot through that stuff. Already he knew to look for snow peas, that the snow peas were there. Ah. And that I was like, hmm. And I looked at the back of the packet. I'm like, how bad could it be? I got it at the hardware store. Right. And this was pre-internet. And I was looking, and I'm like, it's a nerve toxin. Oh, my God. Like, I don't want my... You know, and I talk to people like once a week that tell me they use seven, and I tell them how dangerous it is for them. That they use it still to this day. Oh yeah, yeah, it's not banned or anything. And it's just, it's a nerve toxin developed during World War II. And so that was the epiphany. Okay. And so I, I, I stopped everything right off the bat and I went to the library, because again, pre-internet, and I read everything, because I'd heard about the, what I thought was newfangled, organic gardening. Okay. And so I read everything I could at the library about organic gardening and I found that it wasn't new at all. In fact, every gardener before World War II was a organic gardener because there were no chemical pesticides, herbicides, or fertilizers. So World War II was kind of this inflection point in gardening oh, because and, and of... And the, the change in you know chemical manufacturing and that sort of thing and making it available and the uh, explosion of suburbia after the war. Yep. Uh, and so how it came from full circle, now my son is 36 and has a two-year-old grandchild and I brought the uh, hazel into the garden 
to look for snow peas. Okay. And I had no concern. I, I know that she could walk around in there barefoot, not barefoot not. and eat anything that she wanted to, and it would be completely safe. There's nothing on there that could negatively affect her wow. in any way. And uh, luckily, my wife was in the garden and took a picture of us together. Like, I was just watching her eat the peas. And uh-huh. then it kind of, like, I'm like, wow, this, this is the wild. Way this was. is like, yeah, he's 35. That was a long time ago. And now the kid's about the same age, uh, you know, enjoying, enjoying snow peas without concern. Right. Uh, there's, there's nothing to being organic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, you think when I made that change, I thought that, I would be an explosion of insects and, right. and things. It didn't work out that way. Uh, nature creates a good, great balance. It's when, you know, when I, when I put that broad spectrum pesticide seven on, right. I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. Killed I killed worms. the bad bug. But? I was not looking at the big picture. I killed all the good bugs and I killed soil life underneath. Wow. So the part of the organic weight of gardening is that everything that's underneath is helping you garden and it is Mm -hmm. whether it's in a container whether it's in the soil it is helping you garden and any input Mm -hmm. that you put in there you want to do that in a way to not negatively affect no is that a double negative you don't want to negatively you you don't want to negatively affect anything that's underneath right like when i fertilize my containers it's a fish-based organic concentrate that makes everything grow like crazy. And okay. if, if I used a chemical fertilizer, there's salts in there. Mm-hmm. And anything from a microbe all the way up to an earthworm could be negatively affected by those salts. I don't want that to happen. I, the pollinators, I want them to help me. Right. If you're what using chemicals in the garden, you know, the, the bug gets the chemical, the bird eats the bug, I want all these things to help me garden. They're all in it together, basically. Yeah, you know, uh, wrens come in and nest mm-hmm. and they eat the cabbage worms. Right. And there, you know, uh, there's some uh, data where chickadees, one pair of chickadees has to collect 3,000 caterpillars for their brood. Wow. One pair. And so when you can sit in the garden, we talked about the therapeutic nature of that, and you've got, you know, little uh, birdhouses there, and the wrens have nested. The therapeutic nature of watching them hunt in the garden and help you and take it up there and hear those little birds sing for their supper. Right. That's that's part of the whole equation. The, of the whole equation. Yeah, you want you don't want to destroy this uh, cycle of nature that that nature has created. You you talked a little bit earlier about balance um, and how gardening and particularly organic gardening is all about balance. I can understand if you're using uh, man-made pesticides, that's taking it out of balance, mm-hmm. right? And then you're continually in this juggling act. Um, but sometimes, like, and, and this is like a hot topic here in Pittsburgh these days, where we have invasive mm-hmm. species. Is that an example of where nature is getting out of balance, or, or definitely to because that a it's bit? introducing something into the environment that has no predator? Right. And we just we need to wait for the predator to figure it out, and the predators are figuring it out. Mm. So spotted lanternfly. This is a problem because people panic. Right. And with the internet, they see all these ridiculous homemade recipes which are dangerous. And folks, if you haven't seen these spotted lanternflies, they're the bright red fluttering. Well, here's the thing. They change stages as they they age. They're called instars. They start black with white spots. Then they're orange with white spots crawling. Now in adult stage, they're the reddish. They're kind of red and yellow and they can't fly, they're jumping. Okay. But they can jump a long way when they start flapping those wings. They can't bite. Uh, they can't hurt you. But I've had people tell me that uh, they were attacked by them and it drew blood. And I'm just like, well, maybe the wing hit you. or They maybe. do land with a thud. Yeah, like you know, they... but it's not, it's not biting you. Yeah. Uh, and so this is a case where, yeah, and this happens occasionally. But there's good news and bad news about the spotted okay. lanternfly. Uh, first off, it's gonna get worse before it gets better. Okay, that's the good news. That's the bad news. Oh, that's the bad news, okay. It's gonna get worse. Uh, for, you need to identify, know what they look like and kill them whenever you see them. Mm-hmm. And now at this point in the season, they'll start laying eggs. Kill okay. as, scrape as many of those as you can off. Okay. Next year's gonna be worse. But as we follow the, the path of the spotted lanternfly from Berks County in 2014, Okay. It's moving a lot slower than they thought. There's not nearly as much tree death as they thought. And predators are figuring it out. So mm. behind us in the east, 
again, they had it really bad. Okay. Now it's not so bad. Okay. There's, there's a balance created. The, the interesting thing about the spotted lanternfly, and this came from an interview I did with an entomologist from Davy Tree, is that most sucking insects, well, many sucking insects have a pump to, to pull out the liquids they want from the plant. Okay. Spotted lanternfly does not. It has to re it relies on positive pressure from the plant. Okay. So that means it can't feed on everything. Hmm. That's a positive. Like in my garden, they were all over the roses, uh, but never went to the tomatoes or the peppers or anything. Okay. Their number one um, food source is something called tree of heaven, which is a invasive weed tree that we don't care about. Okay. People have called me to their homes. Can you please come and, and identify the spotted or the uh, tree of heaven so I can cut them all down? I'm like, no, don't do that. Yeah. Because when you cut those down, they're going they're go to come else. to something else, like yeah. your grapes or something like that. Let them do whatever they want on the spotted lantern fly, or on the, uh, the tree, tree of, of heaven. heaven. And because we, we don't care about that. And it's kind of the spotted lantern fly is kind of moving along the rail lines. Interesting. That's how they move. And there's lots of tree of heaven along the rail lines, and that's how we see in infestations more so in the city and now working its way out into the suburbs. So they're basically following shipping or logistics mm -hmm. paths. Yeah, like they're in a pallet or something like that. Okay. Uh, they, they love uh, as hot as it can be. You know, you're out there in the full sun, gravel and rail lines and, and you know, rail cars. Right. It's the perfect environment for them. And then they have their favorite. They can jump off and say, oh, man, here's Tree of Heaven. Here this we go. is awesome. Time for lunch. Yeah. And then you, you get tired there. You're like, oh, I'm going to hop back on a train and head towards uh, Pittsburgh. Are these cycles that we go through? Because I'm thinking, you know, a few years ago you had uh, the stink bug. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I remember growing up you had the, uh, what was it called, the Japanese beetle. And the, gypsy moth. Gypsy moth. Yes. After th that. This, is, this is all cyclical. And we always hope that nature will create a balance. And... You know, we're already identifying lots of predators, praying mantis, spiders. Mm -hmm. The thing about the spotted lanternfly is its coloration, because it's bright colored in nature, that usually means poisonous. So like predator, beware. Yeah. But eventually, like first the chickens figure it out. You okay. know, like one lands in the chicken coop and they're just like, you know, that's the same thing happened with stink bugs. You know, like we, that's the first thing we heard. Like somebody, you know, called on the radio show, hey, my chickens are eating them. I'm like, oh, I had a call from a woman who said she was, catching them with tissue in her house and throwing them into a, a wastebasket on the deck. And every morning, the tissues would be all over. And she's like, what's going on? Yeah. It was wrens coming in and getting the bug oh. and then flying out and somehow the, the tissues okay. were going out. So we figure out, we see... Um, some, high, some predator that's higher on the... Yeah, the they're, they're figuring it out. They're like, this is an easy mark, you know? Okay. And like I said, and then the worst thing they do is they excrete this stuff called honeydew. Okay. It's sticky and disgusting. Like if it's on a maple tree above your deck, you're gonna be miserable. Uh, okay. uh, if it's uh, out in the woods, who cares? But that honeydew is where the real problem is, not really the feeding on the tree because okay. it causes fungal issues and all sorts of other um, sorts of diseases and stuff. And so that's, it's more disgusting than damaging. Right, oh, that's interesting. One, maybe move on uh, to other, if not invasives, but another kind of challenge that we're seeing, uh, particularly in the urban forests, but also I think in the suburbs too, is deer um, and the deer population. Um, what effect does that have on you know, forests and uh, kind of the, the life pattern? I know a lot of people have you know, deer in their gardens and they get upset and they eat like the tulips or whatever. Um, what's some of that process about now that we're seeing in Pittsburgh? They're here, okay? There's not much we're gonna be able to do unless laws change, unless, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've seen some stuff in the news, they're gonna send people in, bow hunters. That's gonna upset animal lover. It's just gonna yeah. be a, so all we can do as gardeners, and trust me, I, I live in a Disney movie. <laughs> I mean, it's fawns and uh, bucks and uh, it's just, and they have no fear. Right. First is a physical barrier. Okay. You know, whether it's around a plant, around a property, around a garden, a physical barrier. Secondly is a repellent. Yep. Have that spray out and you have to use it religiously. Uh, like the day we're recording today, it rained last night. Mm -hmm. My first job is gonna be, I'm gonna go around and I'm gonna spray the spray things that I know around. that they, they want. And 
when you have a good repellent, they'll never touch it with that repellent on. Uh, the one I use really smells bad. Okay. Uh, but I don't care because I want that stuff to survive. It only lasts, the smell only lasts for a day or two. And then it sticks on there so you can go like three rains. Okay. Uh, and then thirdly, grow things that they don't like. Hmm. And this is the most challenging thing because every herd eats differently. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah like in my mother's flavors. garden, they would eat the forsythia to the ground. In my garden, they won't touch it. And the, the, what's happening here, and then the other problem is um, you'll have something for 10 years, and then they'll come eat it. And that's because when they herd up, they're starting to herd up now. Right. Or after the rut, actually, they'll start to herd up. And then they'll uh, follow that older deer, what we call the alpha deer around, and it's like, you eat that, you eat this, you eat that. Yeah, you lose that deer. Now you get one of these plants, and I grow one of them, it's called mountain laurel, and it has these soft buds, Okay. and it's poisonous to them, but they don't know it. And they'll eat that mountain laurel bud, and then go sleep it off in the woods and say, oh, I'm never eating that again. Okay. But the buds are gone, meaning the flowers are gone. So that plant has to be protected. And so it's a never ending battle. Interesting. You know, and like I said, the, the sprays, but you, you know, you always forget to p spray. Mm -hmm. And the day you forget, you go out and you're just so upset because you spent all summer growing whatever it might be out there. Uh, if you want something that you, the deer will not eat, there's, a, there's lots of lists out there. Okay. You know, for me, all the different salvias from the sage family. You know, that's a good annual or perennial that you can stick out in unprotected areas and they, you can never say it's deer proof. Right, because their taste could change, like yeah, you said. Yeah, but it, they r have never touched it in my garden. They walk right by it. And so, you know, I talk a lot about my deer resistant plants, uh, you know, what they'll just walk right by. And um, that's, just, that's just part of it. You're going to have, you have to learn to live with them. Mm -hmm. And again, I hear lots of people are just giving up. They're just like, well, I just can't because of the deer. And I'm like, well, I've got a herd of like 15 deer in a four acre area that have no fear, but I'm growing. Yeah, you gotta learn to work with yeah. them. It's yeah, all yeah, part yeah. of that balance. Yeah, it, you know, I want my containers. I want my impatience. I want my tulips, mm -hmm. you know, but you just gotta figure out how to do it. Yeah. You know, you gotta outsmart something with a brain this big. <laughs> <laughs> And sometimes they always win, it seems, right? Um, you know, looking to kind of wrap up here a little bit, and one of the things I wanted to ask you too, um, you know, off here we talked a little bit about farm to table, and it is like the, the fall season. Are the things that get you excited in terms of like stuff that you're going to be harvesting out of the garden or, or things that are coming from farmer's markets and things like uh, that you're ready to put on the table um, uh, for you and your family? Well, it's tomato season yeah. this is the peak of tomato season and so i've got peak some tomato i mean there's nothing like a homegrown tomato right you know the complicated recipe of two pieces of white bread mayonnaise one slice put them together go to heaven yeah <laughs> you know that's 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 it for me that'll continue through october uh and then right before frost will be i'll harvest all the peppers okay i want to let those peppers go as long as they can change color mm. you know turn red or yellow whatever color that for, for their ripeness and for me it is figuring out every day how to use them in the kitchen okay and how exciting that is like oh i've got tomatoes and people are coming over i got or i have uh you know i had this one tomato chocolate sprinkles and i was chocolate sprinkles yeah okay uh and I had this idea, and I've become obsessed with avocado toast, which uh. my wife laughs at me, like, <laughs> avocado toast. <laughs> so bougie. So I was yeah. like, I'm, I was doing a cookout, and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna mix the avocado with the mayonnaise, Duke's mayonnaise, of course. Okay. Uh, then I'm gonna put smoked salmon, then a piece of basil from the garden, and then two little itty bitty chocolate sprinkles on top of each one. And people went nuts for it, you okay. know, because it's all the fresh stuff, right. and, uh, you know, they never saw chocolate sprinkles before. It's like a dark striped cherry I tomato. Say, okay. So Sweet. it is like a smaller tomato. Yeah, it's then. a cherry tomato. Okay. And then my son came into town for a day and I made the same thing only with Tasmanian chocolate tomato, which is one about this big, which okay. again has the purplish dark. And I left, that's, that's, the, that's like the last thing on top. And that just intrigues people to like, oh, okay. what is, what is what is this again? Tasmanian chocolate tomato, <laughs> and that kid 
not kid, almost 40. Yeah. He ate like five pieces of avocado toast about that size. Just loved it. Made that way with the fresh basil and everything. So it, it's just, I love anything that I harvest out of there and figure out what I can do with it every day. Like I'm not a recipe person. I, I don't use it. recipes. I just, go by. my feel. wife is the same way. We just make it. We just make it and it, it's hard to screw up. It's, it's delicious when the flavors are so fresh. Simple ingredients, you know, you, you can have a chef put 12 of the fanciest ingredients in, but three simple ingredients, you know, tomato, garlic, basil, for instance. Boom. You mix those together and they're fresh, you, just, you can't go wrong. It makes all the difference in the world. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, let's leave it there. Doug Oster, thanks so much for being with us here on the Green Voice Podcast. Thanks for having me. Uh, sharing some wisdom, and uh, we hope you come back soon. I'd love to. Excellent. Great to see you. Thank you, sir. And so we're back, uh, part two uh, of the Green Voice Podcast here, where we get the dirt on sustainability. We're here at the Frick Environmental Center uh, that's uh, hosted by the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. And I got with me James A. Brown, the Director of Education. James, how you doing? Feeling good, happy to have you guys here. And man, we really appreciate you guys hosting us here at the Frick Environmental Center. Um, we wanted to take a time to you know, learn a couple things. One, about you, and um, actually three things. I said a couple, I wanna learn a lot more than that. Learn a little bit about you and the, the Park Conservancy, um, and then also about the Frick Environmental Center. Sure. But maybe you could just start off and tell listeners a little bit about the Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. Sure, so the Parks Conservancy, we are the nonprofit partner to the city to help keep the parks you know, green, clean, beautiful. Um, we manage a lot of various uh, capital projects in partnership with the city to uh, you know, make sure that we're being equitable in terms of making sure parks, both our regional parks, the big ones like Frick, and the community and neighborhood parks across the region throughout Pittsburgh are safe, beautiful, and accessible for everyone in the city. That's awesome. And so we're here in Frick Park, um, which one of the largest, uh, larger, uh, components of the park system. Um, tell us about Frick and then maybe the Frick Environmental Center. Sure, so the Frick Park is, is, was uh, gifted by Henry Clay Frick through his daughter, who was a really big you know, outdoors um, mm -hmm. advocate. And uh, you know, this has been the home to some form of a nature center really since the beginning. Okay. Um, and so uh, the Frick Environmental Center that's here now is built on the same land that the previous one, which burned down, uh, I think in the early 2000s, okay. um, sits on the same property, but it was really a grand vision to go from just your sort of standard, you know, small, humble nature center, which did amazing work, by the way, yeah. but, but to sort of say, let's be forward thinking and ambitious and imagine an environmental center that is LEED certified and so this is a platinum, lead platinum facility, wow. but also meets the accreditation of the Living Building Challenge, which is really sort of the highest international standard for you know environmental design. And so that's amazing. And so th this, I mean, talk to me about that process, like going through lead platinum and then also Living Building Challenge certification. Like I know that's not easy. Um, it's not easy and it's not cheap. <laughs> it's not easy, it's not cheap. Right. <laughs> um, but the benefits, like when you're here at Frick, uh, uh, the Environmental Center is just amazing in terms of the space, but what did PPC have to do to kind of go through that process? Well, and a, p a point to mention that when we're the city, uh, partner of the city is that, you know, we don't own this facility, we don't own the parks, it's a public right? Building. So it's a public building. It's one of the only uh, lead and, and particularly living building public facilities in the world. Right. Um, and so, you know, you can imagine it's a, a really big process and a big lift to coordinate all the partners on the, you know, on the municipal side, yep. on the foundation, community, to really get everybody sort of believing in, in the necessity of something. That's why living building really is this challenge that it is an invitation mm -hmm. to sort of coordinate all your, all your people and your partners to, to meet this high standard um, of design that's, yeah. And what are some of those activities, I guess, like, you know, what, what are those standards? Like energy, water, like? Sure, yeah, so there's, there's seven petals. Okay, um, so and it's a flower. Like, that's, that's right. Gotcha, okay. And uh, you mentioned two of them. Energy is, is a big one, so we're in net zero energy. We've got our solar panels out there by the parking lot, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, serve one for energy, um, but also do a second, serve a second purpose, which is to collect rainwater. Oh, and wow. so we were also, you know, virtually net zero when it comes to water usage, 
um, because of Sydney city requirements, you know, drinking water has to come come, come through, through the city. It. But all of our landscaping, all of our horticultural work, of course, you know, toilet flushing, all of that is coming off of the, the solar panels. So everything's staying here on the campus, basically supporting the, the ecosystem immediately around the building. The living building is really about not just, you know, when you think about environmental design, you think about oh, using the right materials, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. You think about energy, um, but it's really about actually being restorative to the space where you're building it. So building things, you know, even the way the building is sort of built into the hillside, has a lot of biothermal to it, sort of like using the Earth's heat um, and, and cooling to, to sort of support the cooling of the facility. And then, you know, even something as simple as the amount of trees that had to be taken down to put in this building. Right. There was a commitment to replant um, replant those trees in other parts of the parts of the park. Okay. Um, and in fact, we've I think probably tripled or quadrupled that since then. Um, so just all of the things that go into being restorative to the it, to the it, landscape. And that's like an important word too. I think like restorative. Like that's that's like a high you know restorative. The other word you hear a lot in sustainability circle, circles is regenerative. Right. Um, you know, you mentioned that there was a, a, a fire on this site, and here you've literally kind of reseeded, replanted and now this place is really flourishing. Yeah, and I mean, some of the other petals are, it's not just, it's about nature, but it's about, you know, we're part of the natural world, right, too. So, yeah. you know, the other petals are around beauty mm. and, and, you know, sort of that connection between nature is beautiful. So thinking about the facility as a beautiful space, natural light, um, we've got architectural features that are more on the artistic aesthetic side. We've got an art gallery yeah. in the space, and so it's a place to display local, you know, nature photographers and other types of artists. So those connections between, you know, beauty and nature are important to the facility as well. One of the things that always strikes me when I'm here is the the use of light and windows. Like you can, you're you're obviously you're in a building, you have a roof over your head, but you always feel like you're a part of the park. Um, like no matter which way you go, you're kind of engaging a view or a tree or birds or whatever. What's that like physically being here for you? I mean, it's, it's certainly a wonderful place to work and to show up to every day. I mean, all those features are, were intentional by the, by the architects. Uh -huh. um, you know, a lot of it is about, you know, we're here, it's a public facility, there's resources, there's ways to, you know, we're, we're an educational hub. Right. Um, but really for park goers, we want you to make a stop, grab a map, We've got binoculars here, we've got field guides, but ultimately th the magic is in the park. So get the, out. the way, even the way it's come designed. Come to the building, but get out. That's right. <laughs> like, come in, come in and get out. And we've got, you know, we're here sitting in the living room, which is sort of this informal space. It might be raining, you might want to tuck in here and, and have a cup of coffee or something and That's sit awesome. and have a conversation. But yeah. ultimately, the, we want get you out. to get out to the park. Um, your role is the director of education. Um, talk to me about that, like uh, both in terms of getting people out, but uh, what's the day to day for you? Uh, the day to day, I mean, we're running educational programs year round. Mm -hmm. So during this year, right now, my mind is on the school year. We're just, you know, it's back to school. Yep. And so we've got 23 school partners that we work with, okay. um, mainly through the Pittsburgh Public and Propel school systems. And really, we want we want every kid to have an opportunity to get into the park. Um, not, you know, there's there's ways that kids already engage in parks. There's the playground, there's sports, sure. and those are great but to also get into the woodlands and be curious and to observe nature and to kind of slow down a little bit and to sort of reflect and connect mm -hmm. um, and to get their hands dirty, play with dirt, play with bugs. And I think those connections, um, it sort of ties back to why this building is here and the sustainability yeah. lessons. It's like you have to have these connections with nature at a young age mm -hmm. um, and to have caring people around you to sort of show that to you so that when you get to high school, you get into college, yeah. climate and all these issues that we're wrestling with are meaningful to you. Do you think that that's more and more of a challenge for kids and just to today's society where you know, every technology is so on the present and you know, they're always hitting buttons and having screens and is there a barrier or a hurdle that you have to overcome to help make that connection? There's barriers and opportunities. I think you're right, like, you know, technology screens in front of you. I think there's also, you're seeing trends of people wanting to unplug. Mm. You know, the pandemic sort of set tones for a new generation that's had maybe spent a little bit more time right. um, in the outdoors. Um, you know, the other piece of it is that the environmental field is progressing and the yeah. language that we use to talk about environmental issues is becoming its own sort of niche jargon. And so it's important, again, back to like, scaffolding and getting kids involved in these conversations at a young age yep. so that you know you talk to high school kids who've never really um you know sort of 
thought of that career path and there's just so much it's it's daunting right right and so but w what we find no surprise is like the kids who've sort of had these meaningful experiences along their high school trajectory the when they get to high school it's sort of oh yeah this is you know you gotta i always say you gotta see it to be it you gotta know yeah. these career paths exist to sort of visualize yourself in them. Yeah, um, you have a program that's super special, and I had a chance. Um, uh, it was a really great privilege to come in and talk to the Young Naturalist program. Mm -hmm. um, walk me through the Young Naturalist, and, and you know, for listeners, why is it so important? Yeah, so the Young Naturalist program, it's sort of our sort of flagship program. We, we, do, we do programs K to 12. Mm -hmm. In fact, we actually started, we have an early learning program called Nature School. But we go all the way up to Young Naturalist, which okay. is our, our signature summer internship program. Five weeks, 12 high school students. Um, we take applications from anywhere around the city. Okay. Um, and they get really sort of a five week intensive um, across sort of the, you know, nature-based outdoor environmental education experiences. And so part of it is park stewardship, okay. getting out into the park, learning about invasives, you know, doing trail maintenance, doing these hands-on projects. Okay. Um, but there's another component that, that, you know, you helped with in terms of meeting people in, in yep. these fields and sort yep. of talking to professionals. And so many times we hear like, I didn't know that, like I said, that I didn't know that job even existed. I, I could do that as a career and, and get paid for it right. or whatever it is. And so, you know, this past summer we had, I think 14 different professionals across oh, different industries come and talk, you know, environmental justice, sustainability, uh -huh. green buildings, um, you know, sort of avian, you know, avian ecologists. Okay. Um, and so they get a real cross section of the different opportunities that are out there and mm -hmm. sort of get to speak and hang out with folks in these different different areas. It's so fascinating to me just because y you see kids um, and y you know you're y as an adult as a professional I'm always nervous like going into this conversation like are they gonna listen to me like do they care you know are they gonna be on their phone um, and this group was just super attentive um, great questions and they real thoughtful I think in terms of uh, like their approach to nature um, when you as a program uh, director and when you're kind of educating them, do they have different touch points across the Parks Conservancy also? Uh, so they get to learn more about the organization itself? Sure, I mean in some senses they're sort of experiencing all those pieces in that sort of you know compressed five week time. You know, the steward, a lot of the stewardship work is in coordination with our um, forestry and horticulture team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they get experience some of the different programs, um, you know, and that sort of thing. So they're really getting experience of the conservancy, but even our partners and who we work with, those yeah. are, these are all the people that sort of come in and, and speak and, and collaborate with it us. It builds their network too, I think. Builds their network. And, th and I think what's special is like the, the camaraderie of the group. For some of these young people, you could be the only, you know, you're the science kid in your class or in your school, in your neighborhood, yep. who, you know, everyone else is doing another thing. And so you're the kid who loves birds or loves mushrooms. And mm -hmm. now you get to have this experience with other people who have the same or similar types of interests and passions, which I think is really, that's really good. important. It gives them, builds them confidence too. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's what we see, you know, we do, surveys and check in with them at the end of the program and so much of it is about how much I learned but then also like these relationships I've built both with the teaching staff and the mentors but yeah. also as a, as a cohort. Oh cool. Um, one final question I have for you on the way in uh, and since we had Doug uh, Oster here, Gardner to the Stars and Pittsburghers alike um, here uh, at the Frick Environmental Center, I walked past a garden that you guys put in uh, out front uh, the Slavery to Freedom Garden. Mm -hmm. um, talk to me about that project. Yeah, so that went in sort of uh, right after or alongside the, the, the opening of the building. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's in partnership with the Heinz History Center. So okay. they've got the From Slavery to Freedom exhibit, which is, I believe, a semi-permanent exhibit. It's been there quite a while, okay. um, which sort of chronicles the, the journey you know, that freedom seekers had, their survival from, from you know, slavery to, to freedom mm -hmm. and that history. And so this is sort of the sister garden to it cool. um, in partnership with the, the center. And really the way it's organized is it's the perimeter of the garden highlights some of the different vegetation that freedom seekers would have relied upon mm -hmm. um, for food. Yeah. Uh, in some cases, uh, medicine. Yep. Um, in some cases, you know, there's stories of like put, you know, rubbing peppers on you to sort of ward off the trail of dogs. So, using vegetation and flora in different ways for survival. Okay. Um, I think it's one of the things that has really not shown up in, in the history books and mm -hmm. certainly, you know, in grade school, you don't yeah. learn about the sort of like 
master gardener level or master forager level knowledge right. that particularly some of the you know, um, conductors along the Underground Railroad, people like Harriet Tubman, mm -hmm. would have had to have to, su to survive you know, weeks and months of right. taking people you know, from the South to the North. So we, we wanted to honor, honor that, that history and that, and that experience and then to sort of be another touch point to sort of help reconnect um, and demonstrate that this is truly a space for all mm -hmm. cultures, all people here at the, at the Frick, Par at Frick Park. That's amazing. Well, thank you for sharing that, and thanks for sharing with us here on The Green Voice about the great work that you're doing and, and the Parks Conservancy and this wonderful place uh, that we have here at the Frick Environmental Center. My pleasure. So thanks so much uh, for James A. Brown, Director of Education here at the Frick Environmental Center with the Pitts Pittsburgh Parks Conservancy. I'm Grant Irvin, your host from SMB USA. Thanks for listening in, and we will check you out next time. Take care and be well. Thanks.